As British troops prepared for war, Prime Minister Anthony Eden was about to address the nation on the Suez Crisis. I got a call in the morning, early in the morning, to say that the Prime Minister wished to make a broadcast. And I was to go to number 10 and direct it. We drove to uh, Downing Street and asked Sir William Clark, who was his PR man, and I said, what, what's going on? And he said, I don't know. I think, I think the old man, I think the old man has gone mad. It was one of the most important broadcasts of Eden's political career. With the fate of his regime in the balance, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser also broadcast to his people. All of us had a gun at home so that when they entered Cairo, we would shoot from the windows. Well, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. The next three days of bloody battle and momentous political struggle would define Britain's future on the world stage. He had been Churchill's foreign secretary during the Second World War. But Anthony Eden did not appear to be coping well with the current crisis. He was in the bed, sitting up. Uh, but what was very alarming was that on the shelf at the back of the bed, there were whole lines of, of pills in bottles. Uh, and he looked dreadful. I mean, he was very ill. Do come in, David. What we did was to take police action. Obviously, his health was, um, from the physical strain of the whole thing, was um, not getting any better. But personally, I don't think it in any way affected his judgment. I certainly got the uh, impression that it was personal uh, between him and NASA. <laughs> Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser had nationalized the Suez Canal Company, then jointly owned by Britain and France. As part of a secret deal with the British and French governments, Israeli paratroops had attacked Egypt, and now British planes were bombing Egyptian airfields. An international crisis was enveloping Downing Street. I felt as if Suez Canal was flowing through my drawing room because the whole of Downing Street was awash with, with Suez, morning, noon and night for weeks and weeks on end. To end the fighting and to separate the armies. The only contribution I made was in, in the view of all the cabinet sitting there, it was I who, I, who said, look, I, I do think, Prime Minister, that if you're going to give a good performance uh, this afternoon and a few hours time, uh, you really ought to rest. Very well, if you think it best. Would you all mind? Very well, he said. And, uh, and we all filed out. Good evening. I know that you would wish me, as Prime Minister, to talk to you tonight on the problem which is in everybody's mind. Eden's wife was aware of just how important the broadcast was. She looked at the picture um, on, on the monitor and it looked very washed out. And with like sort of 10 seconds to go or a minute to go before I was going to be on the air speaking to the world, she said, it's conspiracy. Nobody can see the Prime Minister's moustache. And she took out some eye mascara and darkened his moustache. And it was, it was touching, really. She had a deep affection for him. Um, and uh, he was very ill. He was so determined to go on, you know, he just charged on. All my life, I've been a man of peace. Working for peace striving for peace, negotiating for peace. And I'm still the same man, with the same conviction, the same devotion to peace. 
I couldn't be other, even if I wished. But I am utterly convinced that the action we have taken is right. There are times for courage, times for action. And this is one of them. Good night to you all. I remember him saying to me after the broadcast, you know, people say we should have done this earlier, um, but actually uh, we couldn't, I, the, I couldn't get forces there to the, to the canal in time. The Egyptians were preparing for an all-out Anglo-French invasion. Thousands of weapons were distributed to Egypt's civilian population. What they did is they asked us all to train to shoot guns. And we had the old Lee and Enfield guns still in those days. And they gave me one and they took me to training for, to shoot. I said, why, why do you want me to shoot on what? They said, when they enter Cairo, you, want, you have to stand in your balcony and shoot on the invading troops. I said, but if I shoot at somebody, first of all, I'm unlikely to hit anyone because I'm a very bad shot. Secondly, they would shoot back at me and destroy the whole building where we're living. I mean, what's the point? That's an idiotic thing. I'm not going to win this war. In Britain, not everyone agreed with Eden's tough stance on Suez. The day after the broadcast, the Labour Party organised a massive protest in Trafalgar Square. I remember the loudspeaker vans calling out they went down these narrow brick streets, you know, law, not war. You know, come to the demonstration to Fargo Square, law, not war. I knew it would be big and it was enormous. The only speech I remember is in Iron Burton. We found ourselves laughing all the time at the great Burton speech. If Sir Anthony Eden is sincere in what he is saying, and he may be. He may be. Then, if he is sincere in what he is saying, then he is too stupid to be a prime minister. Bevan was having an anti Suez rally in Trafalgar Square, and I was just sitting in Downing Street, and I thought I might go up and have a look and went walked up to Trafalgar Square and I stood on the edge of the crowd and after a bit some of the people on the edge kind of recognised me and of course the ones on the edge of the crowd I suppose were just curious and passers-by and they all came rushing round me and saying you know good on you and keep it up and I, of course the, the anti suez people were all near Bevan in the middle but then it got rather kind of noisy so I thought I'd better go away it gave me the impression that, you know, most people were still really for Suez. But the opposition to Eden was more vociferous. And we went down Whitehall to try and get into Downing Street to see Anthony Eden. And then a big riot eventually began because this was a very determined, very, very angry crowd and the mounted police began to charge into the crowd. We weren't used to the idea that the police could use force. Neither were we used to the spectacle of policemen on horses charging into an unarmed crowd and clubbing down women. That seemed unbelievable. We couldn't believe we were seeing this. We had a trust in government and a trust in the state. And Suez marked the end of that. It marked, suddenly, the realisation that the state could be criminal, that a British government could lie, cheat and commit unforgivable aggression. Cairo, NASA watched pictures of the Trafalgar Square riot with satisfaction. He revealed his contempt for the British Prime Minister to a close confidant. Eden Daif. Daif Shahsaya. 
ضعيف في موقفه داخل حزبه وداخل حكومته ضعيف في موقفه قدام بلاده وزي العديد من الرجال الضعفاء بينجذب لفكرة القيام بعمل عنيف Any further delay, even by 24 hours, will make it far more difficult to resume military operations afterwards. And if we do continue... As the demonstration raged outside, Eden now held the most crucial cabinet meeting of the crisis. The only pretext for the invasion was to intervene in the war between Israel and Egypt. But it now looked as if the Israelis were going to accept a United Nations ceasefire the cabinet had to decide whether to go ahead with the invasion. I propose we move to vote. Eden asked the cabinet formally to indicate their views. I am for proceeding with military. Most of the cabinet were in favor of going ahead with the invasion, but two were for calling it off and four were for postponement. Among the high profile dissenters was leader of the house and influential Tory, Rab Butler. Jane Williams, one-time secretary to Winston Churchill, is Rab Butler's niece. She was living with her uncle during the Suez Crisis. Rab was totally exasperated. He also felt that he was being excluded from the whole situation. His opinions were not asked. Uh, he was ignored. And he was very, very dubious about the... Uh, wisdom of the whole operation. He felt that um, sending in troops was not the right thing to do. He felt that strongly and he thought it would end in disaster. With the cabinet divided, Eden reportedly adjourned the meeting to await news of the possible Israeli ceasefire. I think it best if we adjourn for a few moments to allow me to consider my position. He would say, you know, all of us were deeply worried about Antony. Um, people do criticize him. They wonder whether he's up to the job. Um, and it seemed to me that it was strangely unsympathetic to Eden. News from New York. The Israelis have not agreed to a ceasefire on terms acceptable to the United Nations. Brother! <laughs> May I now assume that we unanimously agree to continue with the initial phase of our operation and airborne landings tomorrow morning? With no ceasefire, momentum for invasion was unstoppable, and the cabinet swung behind Eden's fateful decision. The omens looked good for the Anglo-French campaign. The Egyptian army was already suffering at the hands of Israeli troops. Despite the defeats, support for Nasser in Egypt remained strong. This was a blow for Eden, who hoped that military reverses would topple Nasser's regime. Regime change was always part of the policy, but never avowed. And this, of course, is one of the extraordinary similarities with Iraq that in both cases there, were, there was a dual objective, the second one being of regime change, but the second one was never avowed on either occasion. But in order to achieve that, uh, a, a pretext was necessary for the launching of the operation in both cases. And in both cases, a certain amount of deception was practiced in order to achieve the pretext daybreak on November the 5th. 668 paratroopers flew towards El Gamal airfield west of the Suez Canal at Port Said. The boys in the aircraft had this miraculous capability to sleep anywhere. 
and half of them are straight out cold, having a, having a few zeds. Something to do, we started singing, and we all know we was going uh, to the Mediterranean beach, so uh, it was appropriate that we should sing, we do like to be beside the seaside. Yes, I do like to be beside the seaside. Oh, I do like to be beside the sea. Yes, I do like to walk upon the prom, 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 where the brass band play till the om, pom, pom. As we got near, we all stood up and got ready with our equipment and moved forward to the door. I had my toe on the outside and looking down uh, could only see the sea below me. The red light was on and then you're all poised up, ready to go. And then suddenly green on go and bang, 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 we were all out. There was a moment of beauty going out of the door, yellow buff sand, a great cloud of black smoke from the control tower buildings of this airfield we were attacking, and wonderful colored sky, a sort of lavender blue, and all these parachutes ahead of me streaming down and opening one by one. And I just remember thinking, this is a lovely moment. On the ground, the lightly trained civilian resistance mobilized as best they could to support the Egyptian army. Around 5 a.m., just before dawn, when we heard that foreign troops were landing, we went to El Gamil airfield. We took the guns we'd trained on. So when we saw them coming down in their parachutes, we started shooting at them. I'd noticed all these fireflies almost streaming across the view. And I did then realize that they must be tracer bullets. And I thought we're giving these people hell, hooray. Of course, all the wretched tracer was actually directed at us. As soon as we saw the soldiers coming down with parachutes, we started shooting at them. It was my first time. I was happy to kill even one of them. I was happier and happier the more of them got hit. I got this incredible smack in the right eye and um, saw nothing but white fluff on that side. Well, the first immediate feeling was disbelief. You know, I don't believe this has happened. I didn't know what it was indeed. I thought, well, the eyes obviously had it. As it hit the ground, your parachute took a slight breath and you came down with luck like thistle down. A lot of bullets came across the sand, sort of dotting towards me, and I thought, bugger this. Um, you know, I seem to have been hit once, and I'm going to get hit again. The very first thing I saw when I landed, I, I rolled over and I landed right next to an individual that had half his face blown away. He had a half of his cheek was torn out and half of his jaw was gone. He was screaming, and he said to me, what do I look like? And I said, relax, it's all right, you're, uh, you're going to be okay. Meanwhile, French paratroopers were landing on the other side of the canal, east of Port Said. A British contingent landed with them. The French, with their great experience, carried their weapons through their harnesses. And, and we weren't allowed to, in case they got caught up in rigging lines or somebody else's rigging lines. And so we had to um, have ours wrapped in containers, personal equipment containers. And, and so I landed there with no weapons at all, other than this container. And 
then I couldn't undo the belly thing. Despite the build-up, most Egyptians were amazed that the invasion had actually gone ahead. I never had thought that they would do anything like that. I mean, it was incredibly stupid. You must admit today that this aggression was completely idiotic. I mean, you don't just go into countries, like we see that now also, that it's completely idiotic. You don't just walk into a country and invade it. You don't do that sort of thing. For what reason? For nationalizing the Suez Canal? The Egyptians were putting up significant resistance, and British casualties began to mount. Well, suddenly, this quite big garage was half full of people who'd been brought in on stretchers. And there they were, lying down, um, mostly shocked. And the really impressive thing was nobody complained. These young men had just had their lives ruined, really. And nobody complained at all. Well, I thought, God, if we go on losing chaps at this rate, you know, we're in for real trouble. Um, we'd taken 700 people there, or 600 odd, and if we could lose 20 in a matter of half an hour or so, I thought this is going to be a real party. The British were also fighting a propaganda war. Broadcasting from Cyprus, the voice of Britain portrayed NASA as the source of all the problems befalling the Egyptian people. Well, as um, a sort of crazy man who um, has nationalized something that is of vast international importance, who has brought death, destruction, bombs and everything else upon the Egyptian people, and um, who should be chucked out by them. Very, very crudely put, but it was a fairly crude uh, message. Eden's obsession with uh, Nasser is equivalent to Bush's obsession with Saddam. Personal, irrational, unhelpful. The main body of Paris now headed east towards the town of Port Said at the mouth of the Suez Canal. En route was a cemetery, which became the scene of a fierce firefight. If anybody's ever seen any, any pictures of Dante's Inferno, it would give a, a pretty good vision of the, of the cemetery, because certainly when we got in there, there were, there were um, disinterred corpses. There were these, these enormous mausoleums, which uh, there were bits and pieces of them falling down and collapsing into themselves. They'd, be, they'd been under, uh, under fire. There were Egyptian soldiers running all over the place. British planes were bombarding the Egyptian positions in the cemetery, unearthing long buried corpses. We were hiding in the cemetery and the war plane was flying above us and dropping bombs. We saw graves blow up and corpses swirling around in the air. There'd be a half a body here and a half a body there, and uh, bits and pieces, and a mausoleum falling down, and uh, a, a coffin uh, sticking up, and uh, quite a few uh, dead Egyptian soldiers as well, yeah. Quite a few live ones also. It was very heavy fighting in there. And, and it was it was very uh, very fast. It was kind of like house to house fighting in that sense, except it was <laughs> grave to grave fight. There were there was uh, two Egyptians that were shooting at me from behind a headstones. I walked around the corner. They uh, opened fire on me. They missed, and I I fired at them and I, I shot them both. And then I, I went over to their bodies and uh, I took a, a postcard from, uh, from out of the pocket of one of them. I just wanted to see who it was. This is the first person I'd, I'd ever killed to my knowledge. I've looked at that photograph a, a few times over the years and uh, certainly reflected on, uh, on, on 
how easy it is to take a life when you have a gun in your hand. The international political battle was proving more difficult than the war on the ground. The British had chosen to invade on the day before the American presidential election. President Dwight Eisenhower, who was seeking re-election, had warned the British that he objected to the use of force against NASA. Eden now wrote to Eisenhower, convinced he could overcome the American opposition. Dear friend, I know how strongly you feel, as I do, the objections to the use of force. But this is not a situation which can be mended by words or resolutions. I believe as firmly as ever that the future depends on the closest Anglo-American cooperation. It has, of course, been a grief to me to have had to make a temporary breach into it, which I cannot disguise. If you cannot approve, I would like you at least to understand the terrible decisions that we have had to make. History alone can judge whether we have made the right decision. They were victims, I think, of their own uh, self-deception with respect to Eisenhower. Eisenhower had made so manifest in the specific letters that he personally wrote to Eden uh, that they could not possibly have not recognized that he was adamantly opposed to the use of force. They perfectly well knew that what they were doing would be opposed by Eisenhower. There's no doubt of that. The soldiers risking their lives on the ground had little idea of the desperate political gamble being taken in London. At the cemetery near Port Said, the fighting was reaching a level of ferocity that shocked some of the British paratroopers. I know the expression, take no prisoners. We didn't take prisoners. Yeah. Paris don't take prisoners. Didn't then. Because you didn't. Because you can't, you, you haven't got the men. You haven't got the men to guard them. You know, there's another problem. This is not an order, it's just a thing. It's a thing, you, you survive, you're out to survive, you are. A few hundred, very small few hundred, against potential, potentially, you know, thousands. And uh, something's going to be in the way, it's going to be a problem. Get rid of the problem. You kill a lot of people. There are some shrubs and there were some men in there. I realised there were soldiers in there, so I turned round and I just did a, a rake through the bushes. There were a number of uh, casualties there or dead men, actually. Your training ultimately is to kill, and uh, all your training becomes instinctive, and you kill. Things where uh, uh, somebody with a brand gun would, uh, would have maybe three, four uh, Egyptian soldiers running, and he'd stay open, fire, and see if he could keep them in the air, keep them dancing in the air while he was uh, firing at them. And that was just monstrous to me, that was, uh, it was horrendous. I, I saw so many Egyptians that were essentially executed for no particular reason. I'm pretty sure that if we just kicked their asses, they'd have, uh, they'd have run home. I felt sick, I really did. I, I felt utterly sick and I, on a couple of occasions, I remonstrated and said, why? And I was told to fuck off in my own business. A senior surviving officer from the campaign insists that the Paras followed the rules of warfare at all times. The battle of the cemetery was a, a very difficult battle. But the important thing is, and all our soldiers knew it, that if they took any prisoners, these were to be treated humanely, uh, to be carried back if they were wounded, uh, to our casualty clearing station and to be treated uh, as human beings as under the Geneva Convention. How could a rifle fight against a warplane? When we realized that nearly three quarters of us were killed, we pulled out. 
we ran away. As darkness fell on the Egyptian battlefields, British commanders were content with the advance towards the canal zone. But in Downing Street, there were some troubling developments. That night, Eden's private secretary received a call from the French embassy. I suppose it was round about midnight when I was woken by a telephone call from the French ambassador. Uh, he said there had been a letter from Bulgarin, and had I read it? Nikolai Bulgarin was the prime minister of the Soviet Union. Relations between East and West were strained following the recent uprising in Hungary. The day before the Suez invasion, Russian tanks had entered Budapest. Soviet troops were currently occupying the National Assembly. Now, in his letter, Bulganin issued dire threats of retaliation for the invasion of Egypt. There were threats of uh, determination to crush the aggressors. The question was whether uh, this should be shown to the Prime Minister straight away, which would mean waking him up. Having pondered over this for a bit, I thought that the best, most sensible thing to do was to leave it until the early morning. The next morning, the second phase of the invasion went ahead. We were on the flight deck early in the morning. The sun was breaking in the eastern sky. With Valley, was it half past two in the morning? So exciting, you just can't believe it, you know. I mean, it was the very thing you joined up for, you know, to be in uniform, to have a rifle. We've been practicing for nine months how to shoot and how to kill and how to assault, and here we were actually doing it. You know, we couldn't believe our luck. While the Paras approached from the west, a large Anglo-French fleet now attacked the canal zone from the sea. I recognized that this was a serious enterprise when I went up one morning and I saw this vast armada, uh, mainly French battleships and aircraft carriers all around, and it was quite clear that you know, this was a sort of second D-Day almost. We were definitely going to do it. At four o'clock in the morning, the naval guns opened fire at the coastal defences. Jet fighters strafed the beaches in preparation for the landing. At a quarter to five, Royal Marines of 40 and 4-2 Commando began their assault. Their objective was to seize Port Side at the mouth of the Suez Canal. Once the town was secured, the British could press on and take control of the canal itself. Four-five Commando now joined the attack by helicopter. Just as we were about to get in the helicopters, a cheerful naval officer announced on the broadcast, um, we've just received word that there is, uh, that 45 Commando can expect heavy opposition ashore. <laughs> That's the last thing I heard as we got in the helicopters and flew off. Quite impressed actually. The bombardment looked as though it was very efficient. There was lots of black smoke, and uh, you got the feeling that somebody had taken a hell of a pasting on the beach. And hopefully, when we landed, we would, wouldn't be quite so rough. And then we're flashing across the water now, going over the 50 feet above the sea. We can see ships out to the west. And then suddenly, we're over the beach, and I can see the shacks which are on fire. The uh, still burning, still smoke. The beach huts. 
and then we were down, 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 and suddenly we hit the deck in a cloud of dust, uh, and as we leapt out, not knowing where we were really, I don't remember that we were being told we were going to be landed at the Lesser Statue. We landed, hit the deck, bang, out through the doorway, which is what we've been trained to do, run out 20 yards, fling yourself down. Don't know where you were, fling yourself down, come on aim, in a firing position, all round defence. Helicopter takes off, clouds of dust, and there we are on the beaches in Port Said, and there's bullets flying over, and the sound of gunfire, and, and you think to yourself, God, we're here. <laughs> That morning in London, the political crisis was coming to a head. Shortly after Eden learned of the threats from Soviet Russia, news came that the international money markets were turning against the pound. The Chancellor of the Exchequer began to wobble. Well, Harold Macmillan started to, uh, I won't say lose his nerve, but he started to, to backtrack um, when there started to be a run on the pound. Surely the issue here is financial. Macmillan informed his cabinet colleagues that there had been heavy selling of sterling overnight in New York. Devaluation and the death of sterling. Some of Eden's allies believed that Macmillan may have been playing a double game, using the crisis to advance his hopes of succeeding Eden as prime minister. Well, Harold Macmillan was a devious man, I think it's fair to say. Eden was a much more straightforward character in every way. I have just received confirmation during this meeting that unless we agree to a ceasefire... To support the value of sterling, Britain was spending millions of pounds from its reserves. But Macmillan overstated the scale of the financial crisis. In addition to this, there is the serious danger of oil sanctions. You could say, perhaps, that Hal Macmillan was more subtle. I don't think that he betrayed Eden during the crisis. But I, th I suppose he saw it as an opportunity to replace him, yes. In Egypt, the British forces were now entering Port Said. They encountered some desperate resistance. We then embarked half the unit in the LVTs and drove down the center of uh, the town, uh, being sniped at by snipers from windows from the fifth floor uh, down, and also we had grenades chucked in. Some of the young men with us only had wooden sticks. People who didn't know how to use guns just held sticks. Even women came out to fight with us. Initially, we'd reach the building, ground floor, and walk away and clear it. Clear each floor. Kill anybody who's in the room. We saw this emplacement disappear in a cloud of smoke and dust and people screaming. And the routine then is to up and charge and kill anybody who's still alive. We reckon there were some that were 12 years old, and I saw one sergeant take the weapon away and cuff him around the and told him to bugger off. He could hardly carry the weapon. He, you know, he's kind of under now his little little lad. Um, it does cross your mind that this isn't what we should be doing. You, you don't want to kill civilians or, or children, particularly. It would make you hesitate slightly. Unless he was firing at you, then you wouldn't hesitate. The British didn't think that the Egyptian people in Port Said would fight in this way. They thought that the people would welcome them and overthrow Abdul Nasser. But it was the opposite, people fighting to the death. Uh, we had to take cover quickly and we got down behind this wall. We were cowering down, um, really scared. Uh, the, the noise and the machine gun fire around it was just terrific. And uh, all through my head, I, went, I thought, guts it. Uh, I thought about my mother. I thought about my father. Picture their faces. It may have been an instant. It may have been like a one second or a two second instant. And I thought, God, I'm not going to see them again. And I thought, I'm only 19. Uh, I've never had sex. 
never been in love, never been out with a woman, and I felt so despondent in those about three or four seconds because I thought I was going to die, and, and I thought, you know, so unfair. The diehards were stuck in flats in, in a window, and sometimes we'd use the, this 105, basically our artillery, to clear the building. We'd just shoot one of these off and it'd, it'd wipe out anybody in the building. Of course, in those days, I've got to admit it, they were wogs to us in the Marines in 1956. Um, there was Europeans and we're wogs and we freely use that expression um, w without any hesitation uh, and we considered them uh, lesser mortals I, I dare say. Um, we had no qualms about shooting them we were carrying out the aims of the British government Britain had said we've got to take the canal take the canal we would and to the devil the hindmost and living in the Middle East, they were just trouble. Just as military triumph seemed to be within the soldiers' grasp, political defeat was staring their masters in the face. To rescue the pound and to stave off the threat of sanctions from the United Nations, Britain now needed the help of her great wartime ally, the United States President. The response was emphatic. Eisenhower simply told his people in the administration that if they were not to do anything to assist the British with respect either to the currency or with respect to oil until this, they had made a firm commitment and started to withdraw uh, from, the, from uh, Egypt. And uh, he held to that. But unless we agree to a ceasefire, the American government will not support us with the IMF. We've got to stop. With no prospect of American help for Sterling, and in the face of worldwide condemnation, the British government caved in. So we are agreed then. A ceasefire it is. I think he would have gone through with it, and he was always in favor of going on. The cabinet really lost their nerve uh, at the last minute. But while discussions in London veered towards peace, the tragedies of war continued in Egypt. looking along the promenade westward and low down on the horizon I saw a silhouette of an aircraft come towards me and I thought nothing of it and kept walking and then suddenly I looked up again and along the leading edge of the wings I saw little sparks flickering and I thought what's that what's he doing just like that and then there was loud explosions either side of us all the way down the road and uh, bang, 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 bits of concrete going. And for a, another split second, I still thought, what's that? It was a fighter from a British carrier mistakenly firing on British troops. You could see the smoke coming from his guns, and the next, the next second we were hit by a burst of 38 millimeter cannon shell fire, which went through us like a scythe. And then I saw in front of me two or three Marines' bodies going up in the air, uh, rifles and bodies, Coming, going up about eight feet into the air. And I was doing somersaults and came down with a bit of a thud with my left leg hanging by a few shreds. It was only 50 feet above our head, frightening each other, roaring sound, gone. Um, people up ahead, there was bodies all over the place up ahead. Actually, my trousers were on fire as well at the time, so it was quite an interesting situation. It was an absolutely devastating uh, experience. There was a Sergeant Powell on the opposite side. He'd had a shell hit him in the side and all his intestines were hanging out in a plastic bag. And I felt quite sorry for him, actually. He looked very painful. And uh, I didn't appear to be in any pain at all. And, I mean, suddenly, in a matter of seconds, there was carnage all around you, really. Um, and it was the first time I'd experienced the devastation of, of air power, and I never forgot what it was like, and we're only talking about one plane alone. I 
remember laying down on a, on, a, on a stretcher and they brought my colleague in with his um, leg all shattered and we held hands together and I've got a little note on my, a tag on me saying, um, amputate. So that was the end of that. He got the same tag on him. We just shook hands and said, well, at least we'll be home by Christmas. Colin Ireland is not bitter towards the British pilot who mistakenly fired on his own troops. I would have wrung his neck at the time, but uh, afterwards I realised he was doing his duty, possibly a bit too diligently. Um, but otherwise, no, I don't, don't blame him. The friendly fire incident claimed the life of one Marine and 16 others were wounded. But by the end of the day, resistance had crumbled. And with port side secure, the canal was at the mercy of the British and French troops. We had no strength left. We were being attacked from all sides. The town fell because how could we attack tanks and armored cars? We were finished. But after less than 48 hours, the British advance was stopped in its tracks. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. The Prime Minister announced in the Commons tonight that the government have ordered a ceasefire in Egypt at midnight, subject to certain assurances by the United Nations Secretary General. We were pleased that uh, it had come about um, because we had done our job. But what we couldn't understand was why our advance had been halted. We could certainly have completed the occupation of the canal. We were only about 24 hours off doing so. Um, and I think that we would have had then an ace in our hand. Uh, and I certainly regretted that it was called off. And Eden certainly regretted calling it off. In a Cyprus military hospital, it was calm after the storm. Lieutenant Kavanagh of Worcester, a doctor, was wounded by anti-aircraft fire as he parachuted down. I thought this is simply terrible. I mean, we've gone off on this bloody awful expedition, which nobody could justify. And these boys have been wounded and ruined and died for nothing. And that didn't seem to be right. After the ceasefire, there were still thousands of British troops in Egypt. Soldiers like young army captain Michael Parkinson faced an increasingly hostile local population. It was the first time that I had seen men at war. It was the first time that I had, I had heard and, and been under gunfire. And uh, I didn't come out of it very well. I mean, I, I just didn't, I didn't, didn't like it at all. We were driving through uh, in, in this convoy through the streets around when the mob came across an intersection and in front of us uh, and, and isolated us from the, the rest of the, of the parade. And I sat there looking at them and they were looking at me, and there were four guys in the back who were not armed. I had a, the 45, which I mean, I'd never fired in anger, and he had a Sten. And we're looking at it, and it seemed like an eternity. And then one of them jumped on top of the, of the Jeep and started jumping up and down. And I thought, we've had it. At which point, my driver got out and said to him, here, I just cleaned that fucking Jeep. He said, get off. And I thought, now we have had it. And I gathered him and got off and parted and we went through. And I thought, this is extraordinary. I mean, I, I, was, I was convinced we were going to be killed on the spot. The British tried to downplay the number of Egyptian casualties, initially claiming only 100 Egyptians had been killed during the invasion. I think the first thing that goes through my mind is death. Uh, I always think about death when I think about sewers. These graphic images were not broadcast at the time. So what about you? The streets were empty, and there was blood and dead bodies everywhere. It was mainly bits that we were picking up. 
But it really was a torso and then a head and then a leg and then uh, a couple of arms and then another half a, half a torso and uh, I'm just chucking them onto the, onto the lorry and throwing lime over them. There must have been uh, several hundreds. I can't see there being any less because we were at it all day picking up the body pieces. We saw lots of lots of dead bodies. I mean, we had dead bodies all around the the apartments where we we were based, of course, because there had been fighting and hand-to-hand -hand fighting, street fighting, to clear the streets. So we saw all that, and and indeed, when we went to purloin our first car in a garage to to get around, um, we to nick our first car from a garage, I suppose, with the word. We looked under the car, and there was because we were trying to push it out, and there were two bodies under there. There's no reason why we couldn't move it. In fact at least 650 Egyptians were killed, around a quarter of them civilians, including women and children. An estimated 2,000 were wounded. Anglo-French losses were 26 dead, 129 wounded. In spite of the fury across the Arab world and the international condemnation of the invasion, Eden remained unrepentant. We make no apology and will never make one for the action which we and our French allies took together. It was an empty defiance. Britain had been humiliated. Eden hung on to the last desperate hope that with a large army in place, Britain could still maintain some influence and save face. But in the final blow for British power, the Americans insisted on the complete withdrawal of British and French troops. We had not understood that so far from doing this, the United Nations, and in particular the United States, would insist that all advantages gained must be thrown away before serious negotiations began. This was the most calamitous of all errors. Had we expected it to be perpetrated, our course might have been otherwise. But we could not know. As it seems to me, the major mistakes were made not before the ceasefire, or in that decision, but after it. I did not foresee them. I think he felt let down by the Americans, that's serious. I think he was... Um, uh, disillusioned and disappointed by their behavior because you know, he'd always considered them as allies and loyal. Eden also came under serious pressure at home. Suspicions were growing that the British government had played some role in provoking the war with Egypt. In fact, two months earlier at a secret meeting in a French villa, Britain had conspired with the governments of France and Israel to start the war. On the 20th of December, Eden was asked in the House of Commons whether he had prior knowledge of the Israeli attack. I want to say this on the question of foreknowledge, and to say it quite bluntly to the House, that there was not foreknowledge that Israel would attack Egypt. There was not. Anthony Eden, one of the great international statesmen of his generation, had misled the House. It was to be his last appearance in the Commons. Days later, Britain withdrew its troops from Egypt. It was the final humiliation. All I want to do is to get home. That's all I want to do, get home in one piece. I mean, I know it sounds... It sounds uh, Sounded rather sort of callous, but that, that was the way it was, and most national servicemen felt that way. With his health failing, Eden addressed the cabinet for the last time. As you know, it is now nearly four years since I had a series of bad abdominal operations. Um, 
which has left me with a largely artificial inside. In short, the doctors have told me that I should not last long if I remained in office. It was announced from Buckingham Palace that the resignation of Sir Anthony Eden as Prime Minister had been accepted and a statement from Number 10 gave ill health as the reason. I wish my successor all good fortune and Godspeed to you all. Goodbye. Thank you very much. While Suez marked the end of Eden's political career, Nasser emerged triumphant. Nasser became the biggest hero in the Middle East. He became a god because they considered that he had defeated France, Britain and Israel by throwing them out of Egypt. And he became a god. The meaning of Suez is that there is an end to the methods of the 19th century. Suez gave confidence to many countries. I think Suez helped many of the African countries to be sure of themselves and insist about the independence. For the rest of his life, Nasser remained an iconic figure. At his death, he was mourned across the Arab world. In the wake of Suez, Iraq had followed Egypt and overthrown its king. Arab nationalism swept through the Middle East. For all the achievements of his political career, Eden's reputation will forever be defined by his role in Suez. My memory would really be that um, he, his determination and, uh, to, to go through with it and, and his fortitude. It, I mean, never doubted that what he was doing was right. But Eden's ill-fated invasion of Egypt became the single most enduring symbol of Britain's post-war decline. We have the trappings of a great power, but after Suez, we really know that it is empty. It's a pretense, it's a husk. We are not a great power anymore. We can't pretend to be, uh, as of right, through our own strength, sitting at a table with the Soviet Union, United States, China. It's a myth. The events of the crisis from the Egyptian perspective tomorrow, the other side of Suez at nine on BBC Four. If you haven't got BBC Four, you can find out how to receive it by calling 08700 10 10 10. Here on BBC Two, Jeremy Bowen is in the hot seat. Have I got news for you is next. <laughs>